Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, this is a breaking story, actually, and it's something that we, we, we've been waiting for a very long time. Um, a lot of people uh, were wondering whether the 9-11 Commission's interview with George Bush, uh, the President of the United States, and former Vice President Dick Cheney's interview would ever be released, or was it ever had? did it ever happen? Well, uh, just yesterday, the Wall Street Journal released uh, uh, the uh, record of the joint interview involving the former President Bush and the former Vice President Cheney, um, which investigated the 9-11 Commission, uh, the 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks by the 9-11 Commission. Uh, according to the Wall Street Journal, uh, a source familiar with the uh, now uh, declassified contents of the document of the uh, April 2004 Oval Office interview touched on various matters, including uh, Bush's decision to authorize Cheney to order U.S. Air Forces to shoot down civilian aircraft if necessary. And what we're going to do, it's a 31-page uh, report. Now, this interview wasn't taken under oath, and this is not a verbatim transcript. This is a memorandum for the record. So the note taker who took notes of this interview um, did the best he could with the information that he had in which he took notes and basically made this memorandum of the record. Now, both, like I said before, this is key, both President Bush and Vice President Cheney were not under oath um, regarding uh, what was being said to them by members of the commission. Nevertheless, let's get to it. It is 31 pages. And what I'm going to do is read from page 12, because I read the first 11 pages and nothing really stood out. So this is first time you're going to see it. Uh, for anyone that hasn't read uh, this news, this, you know, this is really big. I mean, this is huge. And the media didn't cover it. Wall Street Journal broke the story. Nobody covered it. I guess nobody really cares about 9-11 anymore. But what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the rest from page 12 onward. And, you know, I'll land in some thoughts of my own, but we're going to read it together so that you can read it for the first time. I'll also link in the bottom of the description um, a link to the PDF file so you can have it as well. So here's Commissioner Tim Rober. Uh, so we'll start from here. Commissioner Romer suggested that the United States could have sent the signal Though, in responding to the attack on the USS Cole, what was the president's thinking on that? The president said he was concerned about an empty response that bin Laden and others would use to propaganda advantage. They could have struck using cruise missiles or other standoff weapons like bombers. If that had been ineffective, the enemy would have used it to show their ability to thwart U.S. technology and military might. That was just the point they wanted to emphasize. So this could have set the United States back much further than any advantage that would be gained from the strike. He looked at the intelligence, hitting bin Laden with cruise missiles. These were important individuals, but you strengthen the group if you launch missiles, but do not harm them. Now, that's interesting, because after the 1998 East Africa bombings, Clinton administration sent cruise missiles to the Al Shifa factory in Khartoum and to an empty uh, training base. And bin Laden was underwhelmed because here, you know, he bought, he helped to facilitate an attack on a U.S. target overseas. And he thought, and that was coming from bin Laden's own sons later on and during interviews, that bin Laden thought that the United States would finally enter Afghanistan and, you know, draw it out, have a drawn out war like the Soviet Union did in 1979. But this didn't happen. So the United States took the attack inside the United States. So for Bush to basically say that, uh, well, that's, that's the height of irony, I think. The president said you must use ground forces for a job like this. If you're going to go after them, you have to get people on the ground. We weren't ready yet, but we were developing a strategy to do so. So it took 9-11 to do that. During the transition, the president said he remembered asking Tennant, that's the director of the CIA, about the value of killing bin Laden. First, this would not destroy al-Qaeda. Second, they never had a shot at him. The president believed that Tennant thought 
he had authority to kill bin Laden. Now, incidentally enough, during the Clinton administration, uh, Clinton and the CIA, well, I'm sorry, the CIA gave Clinton various opportunities to kill bin Laden while they were in Khartoum. Now, this is during the mid-1990s, before the East Africa bombings and before 9-11, obviously. But Clinton administration rejected a lot of these proposals. Commissioner Slade Gordon said the commission was deluged with conspiracy theories. <laughs> he hoped the president could help them address a few of them. For example, why at the hearing of the first plane hitting the World Trade Center did the president go ahead with, this, with the event at school? Yeah, a lot of people wanted to know. The president said he thought it was an accident. He recalled that he and others thought the building had been hit by a twin engine plane. He remembered thinking, what a terrible pilot. And the news of the second building hit, Commissioner Gordon asked. The president said there was no more details. He stayed in the education event for about another five minutes. He has been told. He had told us, he had told us about this. He was afraid to absorb the news. He remembered a child with someone at reading. He remembered watching the press pool and noticing them talking on their phones. He realized that country was under, was watching his behavior. He had to send the right signals. He wanted to collect his thoughts. Commissioner Gordon asked if the president had made a connection to the terrorists or was worried that the school or Air Force One might be a target. The president said no. He was not worried about that. After the event, he finalized an initial public statement. There was a hustle to get it written. He talked to the vice president about it. Eddie DiLorenzo, the head of the Secret Service protective detail, was pushing to get them out of the school and back to the plane. It was his job to protect the president. As to Air Force One, he thinks he first heard about that threat after they were airborne. It was comforting to see the fighters pull up alongside Air Force One. Commissioner Gordon asked if the president or the vice president had been involved in permitting planes carrying Saudi nationals to leave after 9-11. No, the president said. He had no idea about this until he read about it in the papers. The vice president also gave a negative answer. Hard to hear. What a bombshell. Who ordered the Saudis to leave? According to Richard Clark, the counterterrorism czar, he said the order had to come from up high. According to the FBI, they got orders from up high. Who then? ordered the Saudis to leave. If, it's a, if the president said no, and the vice president said no, who ordered them to leave? Director Tennant? He doesn't have authority to do that. Or does he? Who knows? Or is the president lying? Remember, they're not under oath. I think he's fucking lying. The president turned to the problem of conspiracy theories. <laughs> he said the commission had a duty to make it absolutely clear that this action was perpetrated by hateful, evil people. Well, yeah, I can't tell you, he said, how strongly I feel about this. It seems some of the theories some people had written. <laughs> I wonder if it's from Barbara Honiger and the idiots, Alex Jones and Jim Fetzer. Some of the things in the German press, for example, were worse than anything yet seen coming out of even the John Burt Society in Midland, Texas. I guess he didn't see my space back then. <laughs> God sakes. Commissioner Ben Benisti thanked the president and vice president for agreeing to meet with the full commission. He said that the president and the commission were on the same team. They wanted to deal with as many of these conspiracy themes as possible. Their goal was to make the country safer. Commissioner Ben Benisti turned to the summer of threats in 2001. The commission had met with DCI Tenet. Tenet had apparently been confused or uncertain about how often he had met with the president during August. The president was getting intelligence about specific attacks being planned. The president interjected overseas. Yeah, because that's what the CIA told them. Remember, the CIA, Alex Station, and the counterterrorism unit told the FBI when they read the cable about al Hadi and al midar coming to the United States that they were not to share that information. It's CIA information because they said the next attack would be in Southeast Asia because there was a meeting in Malaysia. But how did they make two and two to put together? How did they know that there was going to be an attack in Malaysia unless they had intelligence? Why didn't they share with the FBI anyway? 
they didn't because there was going to be no attack in Southeast Asia. CIA lied to the president, unless the president's lying along with the CIA. I think the CIA lied to him and told him that the next attack would be overseas. Why? This gives the president plausible deniability. Commissioner Benveniste, continuing, said the president had commented on stimulating the writing of the August 6th PDB. The analyst had titled it, Bin Laden Determined to Strike in U.S. Had the president received information before on the potential for an attack in the United States? None, the president answered. We were aware that Bin Laden had sympathizers in the U.S. as the cells. No one ever said that to him. There were things like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed had studied at the College of North Carolina, but he couldn't recall people walking in here, the old office, and worrying about cells in the United States. Not one PDB was commenting on a threat in America. There was no actual intelligence on such a threat, not one. However, there would be foreign intelligence rings like Saudi Arabia and Israel that were monitoring the cells inside the United States. Did the CIA know? I don't know. Did the NSA know? I don't know, but I'm damn well know the Israelis and the Saudis knew because why else were they here in the first place? Can we ask them? Oh, no, wait a minute. We can't. We deported them under orders from the State Department. Referring to the analyst in the title of the PDB, the president stressed that he asked for it. He couldn't remember when, and he didn't say anything about a specific attack. However, that's irrelevant because what was relevant was the nature in which it was attacked. Now, throughout 1999, throughout 19, uh, 2000, we knew, the intelligence community knew, that planes were to be used as weapons. This goes as far back as 1996 when the Philippines arrested a number of operators who were planning to put bombs in planes and then found out that there was another, opera another plan to the operation, which was the Bajinka operation, in which they were going to hijack planes and crash them into US sensitive targets. And they've interviewed one of the co-conspirators, Abdul Hakim Murad, and he told the investigators, as well as the FBI later on, that yes, this was part of the Bajinka operation. They were going to have cells operating in the US, this is 1996 now, who were going to hijack planes and they were awaiting their orders. Commissioner Benvenisi asked if Dr. Rice had been there in Texas when the PDB was briefed. The president said she had not been there. But had he talked to her? Yes, at some point. Smiling, he said he talked to her at least twice a day. He did remember talking about the particular threat cited in the document on Yemenis, surveilling a federal building in New York, to learn that the Yemeni situation had been cleared up. Now, Yemen is was considered the second biggest uh, al-Qaeda affiliate country in the world. Afghanistan was number one, Yemen was number two. And the FBI knew about it. John O'Neill knew that the Yemenis were the key to unraveling uh, what was bin Laden's plans. But the FBI didn't allow him to investigate further, even after the USS coal bombing in 2000, October of 2000. Yeah, they, Barbara Bodine, the Yemeni US ambassador, kicked O'Neill out of the country. Talking to her about it, Commissioner Benvenisi said, yes, Commissioner Benvenisi discussed the Yemeni episode. He said a White House uh, background briefer had put out a story that was ill-serving the president, that the Yemenis had just been a couple of tourists and the matter was put to bed. But our staff, he said, had come to some conclusions about the Yemenis. The staff, he said, had found that these two individuals had been apprehended in Manhattan taking photos of the federal building at 26 Federal Plaza and of the building next door that also housed the FBI, uh, that's redacted, and of the street, which included a security checkpoint. When questioned, the Yemenis had said they were taking the pictures because a co-worker in Indianapolis wanted them. The INS detained the Yemenis who were interrogated by the FBI. Commissioner Benvenisti added that when the FBI attempted to locate the individual in Indianapolis, they discovered that this person was operating under an assumed name and then left abruptly, leaving behind an uncashed paycheck shortly after the two Yemenis were detained. The FBI, he said, had continued to work on this case for two years and have never identified the man who fled. 
first I've heard of it, the president said, same with me, uh, but he said he wasn't sure, he wasn't sure that aspect. Commissioner Ben Benicio said the episode stimulated the FBI in New York City to complain about the level of protection being given by the General Services Administration to government buildings. John O'Neill and Barry Morn, who was from the FBI, were involved. The president said this was news to him. Commissioner Benvenisi asked about presidents not wanting to meet before 9-11 with the director of the FBI because of concerns about politicizations of the Bureau and criminal justice reasons interfering in pending cases, the president said. Commissioner Benvenisi asked if the president had asked Dr. Rice to follow up, had she followed up. The president said he could not recall the details. He remembered that the information in the PDB about 70 pending FBI investigations seemed good, helpful of Rice. If they had found something, he wanted to know about it. If there was any information on a problem, he wanted to hear about it, whether from George Tennant or Condi. If they came in and said, we found a cell, his, his action would have been destroy it. That never happened. Now, also, too, you know, Richard Clark had been trying to brief the president about the dangers of Al Qaeda all throughout early 2001, and Condoleezza Rice asked him that he wouldn't be in on these principals' meetings anymore like he was under Clinton. Why? Commissioner Benvenisti said important information in the possession of the CIA and the FBI didn't get to the president or to Dick Clark. He gave the examples of Musawi and Midar and Hosni and Middle Eastern men learning to fly. If that had gotten to the president, perhaps there would have been some action in meetings with Tennant. Did he mention Musawi? The president could not recall. He explained how these conversations went. Tennant would come in, Mr. President, we have a serious threat. He would describe it. The president would turn to him and others and say, what are we doing about it? That never happened for a threat in the United States. No one said there was a problem domestically. The threat was overseas. That was what George said. That lines up with the CIA telling the FBI that the threat was overseas. Meanwhile, the threat was here, and the CIA knew about it. But they didn't tell the president, and they didn't tell the FBI. The world is riled up. He would review the threats. The vice president said that some of the action had come to him. He called Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Abdullah on July 5th. He went over what was known to him about the al-Qaeda and bin Laden threat. He said the United States wanted to send a team to Saudi Arabia to alert Saudi counterparts about a potential attack. Tenet was talking to Prince Turkey about this. The team would come over to work on this. The president said he thought that if there was a serious concern in August, he would have known about it. Now, everybody in the intelligence community was, you know, the lights were blinking red. The president was in Crawford. Now, Tenet would have a briefer, and he would also go and meet with the president at Crawford, and he lied about that in the 9-11 Commission and said he never met the president once in the month of August. He met him three times. But not only that, everybody was saying, hey, listen, an attack is coming, an attack is coming, and Bush is in Crawford, Texas, like this. I don't need to know too much. I don't need to know too. Don't tell me too much. Plausible deniability, right? He he doesn't know have to know all the details. He just has to know an attack is looming, and that's it. Because he's the one who has to talk to the media. So you know they can only trust him to an extent. And this is the president of the United States, right? He could basically slip up, and we all know Bush is not too clear up here. Commissioner Benvenisti commented that the domestic capabilities were principally under the Attorney General, John Ashcroft, and also the Secretary of the Treasury. After receiving the August 6th PDB, had the President discussed with the Attorney General Ashcroft whether it would be useful to make sure the FBI was addressing the problem? Not that I recall, the President said. He also didn't know whether the Condi had discussed it with the Attorney General. Oh, I'm, I'm sure they did. Remember, Ashcroft stopped flying commercially. Commissioner Lehman, John Lehman, said the commission was united on trying to fix what was wrong. Its report would be could be a catalyst. There were things the president could not do. He hoped the commission in the White House could consult about possible recommendations to be sure we're not working at cross purposes. There were some big things being considered, and this was an opportunity 
for action. The president said the White House had been passive so far in trying to influence the commission's recommendations. They had been silent. He had thought he would hear what this commission recommended. And the one shared by Senator Robb and Judge Silberman and then move. He was hesitant to be product, uh, proactive with respect to the commission. Commissioner Lehman urged the importance of opening up a dialogue. The president said he would consider it. Commissioner Lehman said a big issue was the role of the Saudis. Much had been done, including some viable actions at the highest levels. But there were problems of continued funding. He alluded to a recent story in the New York Times about Saudi imams preaching jihad in Iraq. He mentioned a letter Prince Bandar has sent to the commission that did not fully acknowledge the problem. He mentioned the problem of the former Al-Qaeda chief financial officer and the United States having not received access to him during the late 1990s. He mentioned the belief of an INS inspector who testified in January, Melendez, that there was pressure not to interfere with Saudis. That order came from the State Department. Remember, there was a Visa Express program meant just for the Saudis because we regulate the oil market and we shouldn't offend our friends. The president replied that a fundamental political question for any president was how to deal with the Saudis. There was a sort of split personality there. Some found favor with al-Qaeda and the extremists, supporting the radical policies. The U.S. had to have a process to push them to change their ways. The United States supported political reform. This stand had, the president con commented, been widely disparaged. The last to change will be Saudi Arabia. The president understood that, but they were feeling the pressure. The royal family, the president added, was not a monolith. There were splits within the family. Crown Prince Abdullah may not know what his stepfather is doing with certain NGOs spreading hate, non-government organizations. The family was a complex organization with different power centers. The president said he was worried about Saudi Arabia. He did not want it to become an al-Qaeda country, nor did he want to form an alliance with Iran. He was not sure what else he could say, except that he was working the problem on a daily basis. There had been some progress on NGOs. The vice president mentioned the al Haranian Foundation. Commissioner Lehman said the president should expect the commission report on this subject to be harsh. If that was done at the sufficient level, it might be useful. The president said he did not wish to justify their actions, but he said the commission should also look at Saudi cooperation against al-Qaeda inside their country. The vice president said he had worked on this issue during the summer of 2001 and at other times. He had talked with the president of Yemen. Saudi cooperation had increased after they were hit in Riyadh. He agreed with the president. Saudi Arabia was a complex place. Now, during the mid-1990s, late 1990s, the Saudi kingdom had been paying blackmail money to groups like Al-Qaeda, Abu Sayyaf, Boko Haram, for fear that bin Laden, who was chastising the, the kingdom because they allowed the United States to stay at the holiest sites of Islam, Mecca and Medina. And this uh, disparaging view by bin Laden was known all throughout the 90s. That's why he got deported to Khartoum, Sudan in 1991, when Saudi Arabia kicked him out of the country. But they feared him. They feared his group, Al-Qaeda, which was growing. So they started paying hush money to him in the 90s not to attack the kingdom. But, you know, you could attack wherever. Commissioner Lehman said the intelligence issues involving more than moving the organizational boxes around. The cultural issues were much more important. Good people could make the, hope, the boxes work. It was easy to see organizational fixes, get rid of obstacles. Personnel was harder to attract enough good people in the best bureaucratic system, drawing creativity out of that. The president said, speaking off the top of the head, that it was important to give people access to the president. Analysts should know that they could tell the president what they think. If there was a meeting at Camp David, they should bring out the experts. When people feel that they have access to important officials, it makes them feel better about their job. The government did, meet, did need more human intelligence. Human. You could work on the boxes, on communication, on budgeting but you needed more collection. The war could be won if we can get inside their tents. However, it wasn't a matter of collection. It was a matter of disseminating that collection. The NSA was hoarding information and not sharing with the CIA and the FBI. 
The CIA was hoarding information, not sharing it with the NSA or the FBI. The FBI was, was getting information and it was trickle down information. But they didn't share that information with the NSA or the CIA. So you had all these three agencies not sharing with one another because they hate one another. And you have the State Department, basically, along with the National Security Council, getting a little bit of information because they don't want to know too much plausible deniability. Commissioner Kerry, Bob Kerry, asked what action the president thought was required against al-Qaeda. What happened on the U.S.'s coal? Suppose the U.S. had been hit again, for instance, in March 2001. The president said, on analysis, a cruise missile strike. If you could not catch bin Laden, it was ineffective. He was against carrying out such operations until the government had a plan to eliminate it. He could not remember when this conclusion was reached. It came from conversations with people coming in the White House and maybe with Secretary Rumsfeld, too. Commissioner Kerry said he could appreciate the president's frustration. He asked about whether military capabilities have been presented to get bin Laden. No, the president said. There was not actionable intelligence, at least on bin Laden himself. They never saw a shot at him. Now, according to um, numerous sources involved with the, the camps in al-Qaeda, one of them being Mohamedou Aoud Slahi, who was the subject of a movie called The Mauritarian, who was an innocent Yemeni um, who basically was tortured and uh, stood at Guantanamo Bay for a number of years. He wrote a diary, which became a book, um, and was basically was blamed for being the conduit between the Hamburg cell, that's the pilot hijackers 9-11, and to bin Laden. Um, he is supposed, the government supposedly said that he was the conduit that brought these guys over to Afghanistan and they met with bin Laden. But that all that to be turned out to be untrue, was untrue. So they let him go after like, I think it was like 11, 12 years. Poor guy. Commissioner Kerry asked about special operations. They couldn't, oh, by the way, and Slahi, I'm sorry, I forgot the point. Slahi said that when early, early in Afghanistan, when he was with Al Qaeda in 90, 91, he left, I think in 92, 93. Um, he said that in Afghanistan, he thought that there would be agents there at these camps. I mean, I, it wouldn't be too hard. Now, I'm not talking about maybe CIA or Americans because they would stand out. Could these be CIA affiliates, someone from Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Bahrain, Iraq, Egypt, Pakistan, where they speak Farsi and Arabic? Um, could be. So we don't know. Commissioner Kerry asked about special operations. They couldn't do a full invasion, but the commander in chief needs more options than that. True. The president said he did not see good options for special operations in Afghanistan. Other military operations not been prepared, at least from the time they had started, such operations weren't presented to him. The president added, though, that special operations in Afghanistan could only work if there was a place for, it, for which to launch them. In the Afghanistan case, it took time to get, that's redacted, the United States had to get basing operations established, and that's redacted too. Next, the president went on, once the team was in, where did they look? There might not be a particular spot to go to, but he didn't remember a discussion about why no other options had popped up. The vice president recalled that on the first night of combat operations against Afghanistan, special operations forces had gone at the Mullah Omar's house. They had the location, although they did not find him there. They had gone there blank. One of the helicopters crashed blank. That was what they did after 9-11, getting blank to agree on that in advance. He didn't know how they could have done that. Now, all this is redacted, so we'll... <clears throat> we'll continue. The president said the military operations required a strategy which much more in it than just a military plan that was discussed. That was what caused him to direct the development of an NSPD. Commissioner Kerry asked if the CIA had done any analysis of hijacking scenarios, analysis that might have shown up on some of the security problems. Now, this is a great question, right? Because at least this would mean that they got the intelligence reminding him that they were going to use planes as weapons. The president said he was unaware of receiving such an analysis. The president said that on July 5th, Andy Card and Condoleezza Rice had called in folks from the different agencies. Looking back, he commented on weaknesses in watch lists and the lack of hardened doors on cockpits. If someone had said 
here's how Al Qaeda could attack, there would have been a reaction. Now, look, the intelligence was there. This is the Bajinka Operation Intelligence that they were going to use planes as weapons. In the year 2000 and early 2001, foreign intelligence services were warning the United States that planes were going to be used as weapons. They didn't know the details. So the State Department, the CIA, the National Security Council, the FBI, the NSA, everybody, the DIA, the FAA, everybody knew planes were going to be used as weapons. Was there heightened security? Around the country? No. Did the FAA strengthen cockpit doors? No. Did the FAA strengthen security at airports? No. Why? Commissioner Kerry commented that the FAA was not at heightened level of security. Duh. According to what I just found out recently, the Bajinka plot operation was shared with the FAA. Holy shit. That's fucking huge. If they knew about this in 1996-97, why didn't they? The president wondered, though, what they would have done if they had increased their alert level. There had been alerts overseas. There would have been alerts alerted here when Commissioner Kerry said the elements were there. FFA should have done the analysis. Yes, they should have. The president said that would have been helpful. Yes, it would have been helpful. Now, the FAA certainly got under the fire of the 9-11 Commission. That's up on my channel. Go take a look. Commissioner Kerry turned to the intelligence, the intelligence budget. Since the budget numbers were classified, the public did not understand the way money was allocated. They did not understand how much money was spent on satellites or how little was spent on the CIA. They didn't understand that the DCI's budget for CIA was lower blank. The president said the budget process did not did need to protect dark programs. <laughs> of course, he did not want to compromise capability when the war the vice president, he said, had been involved in these issues. Of course, he did. Remember, he went on Meet the Press and said that we may now go. We may have to go to the dark side. The vice president said this has always been a problem. The House Intelligence Committee had just wanted to show the trend in spending. Porter Goss called the vice president for help in getting the data in order to do that. The agency was worried about leaks. Of course he was, because we shouldn't have leaks at a time of crisis, especially during the war on terror, when the CIA and the State Department were agreeing in a backdoor deal that the rendition and torture program would be led by the CIA. All illegal, by the way. Given legality by who? The White House Legal Counsel. Go see my latest video on that. Commissioner Kerry suggested at least declassifying the top line and the overall numbers for individual agencies the president and vice president indicated interest, but they never did. Commissioner Thompson, Fred Thompson, thanked the president and vice president for the meeting. He asked the president about the antidote in Dick Clark's book, recounting a conversation in the White House situation room after 9-11 about Iraq, a conversation Clark said he found intimidating. The president said he had read the page in the book. He believes he might have talked with Dick. He didn't remember. He would remember. But it wasn't true the way he characterized it. The book said the conversation occurred on the evening of September 12th. But the president said he had not gone to the situation room at all that evening. He had gone to the Pentagon. Then he had gone to the residence. And as for the idea that he was wandering around the situation room alone, I don't do that. He didn't think any president would do that, looking for something to do. He couldn't remember such a conversation. Asking about Iraq, he probably did at some point. Intimidating? He objected to that. Of course he would, because uh, the State Department was pressured by who? The Office of Special Plans and the neocons, led by Richard Pearl and Paul Wolfowitz and William Crystal, all those fucking ghouls and vampires who pressured the president, hey, find a connection with Iraq and Al-Qaeda, and use the FBI to do it. The FBI couldn't do it, and so he relegated the CIA, and they made up information. So did the Israelis. And thanks to them, we invaded Iraq. Commissioner Thompson asked if he had talked about al-Qaeda to President Clinton during the transition. Mm -hmm. The president said that President Clinton had invited him here to the Oval Office. He didn't remember much about being said in al-Qaeda because he probably didn't pay attention. There was a lot on North Korea. Of course there was. That's what the Bush dynasty was uh, at odds with. 
that was high on the agenda. Right? Of course it was. President Clinton was thinking of going to North Korea. The president felt sure that President Clinton mentioned terrorism of some kind. <laughs> he shrugged. He did not. He did recall that President Clinton was hot at Arafat and told him about the disappointment with Arafat and the recent developments in the peace process. Commissioner Thompson commented on the tendency of Americans to rely in hindsight to prepare to fight the last war. Who was responsible to ensure that didn't happen? Me, the president replied. I'm in charge of that. You have to get good people, develop a good strategy, and hope it works. The president didn't see much point in assigning personal blame for 9-11. Of course not. Why should we assign blame when the intelligence services were withholding information from certain domestic agencies that could have prevented 9-11 in the first place? Why assign blame? Why? Because they can easily be implicated in a crime. Maybe even malfeasance, for fuck's sake. If the, previous, if the previous administration could have done something to stop it, he was sure they would have done everything in their power. The, the same was true for him. Nobody wants something like that to happen. They would have moved heaven and earth to stop it. The president said he was responsible. That was the job of the president. He had to pick a good group and expect them to do their job with the right strategy. Killing the terrorists was the best strategy. It was the only way to do it. Kill them before they kill us. There would be no negotiations, no peace treating with these people. They are killers, cold-blooded killers who would not hesitate for a moment. They kill women and children. They had killed all these commuters in Madrid. If Bin Laden had weapons of mass destruction, he would likely kill more. In the short term, we had to find them. In the long term, the president thought the spread of freedom was the key. He had a problem with that kind of arrogance in the world. Really? A belief that certain people can't be free. I guess, I guess Iraq is free now. It was so condescending to think that people in poor countries, people of color, were drawn so low that freedom can't spread. The president strongly disagreed with this. He thought democracy and freedom were critical. Of course he did. That's what they did in Iraq, didn't they? And so did Syria and Libya. Right? All that freedom and democracy, it's working so good. It was also, there also needed to be a strategy for the homeland, the president continued. If people thought that defensive measures were inconveniencing now by having to take off their shoes, wait till we go to alert condition red. Holy shit. It was difficult to defend America. He recalled that as governor of Texas, he was familiar with the border problems with the Mexican border. He remembered how the mules would bring immigrants across, people hunting in South Texas would come across piles of garbage from where groups of immigrants had stayed on their journey. But people also might be willing to walk across borders to kill. Isn't that what the U.S. government does? Human intelligence had to improve in order to get actual intelligence. It did work pre-9-11. That's what they did. They did collect intelligence. They got a lot of it. It did work. If there was an attack on our watch, the president said he would be he would bear the responsibility for that. Well, he didn't bear any responsibility. He hoped the commission would make recommendations for improving the situation without violating the constitutional rights of citizens. Really now? <laughs> During that first week in November of 2001, the president's White House legal counsel, John Yu, Alberto Gonzalez, and Vice President Dick Cheney's personal lawyer, David Addington, worked on memorandums in subjugating the civil liberties of detainees called enemy combatants. And they took away the powers of the Department of Justice, who would then prosecute these people and commit them as, and, and then label them enemy combatants with evidence. Well, now it was up to the President of the United States to basically say without any evidence at all, he's an enemy combatant. If we feel that he is an enemy combatant, that means anybody, even you. The president supported the Patriot Act. <laughs> well, of course he did. That's what they signed immediately after 9-11. He didn't want to abridge it and would defend it to the utmost. <laughs> at least he's honest. But he didn't want to suggest that opponents don't love America too. <laughs> oh my God. Commissioner Gorlick thanked the president. 
She said she wanted to raise some mitts and picks. Turning back to the chronology in the morning of 9-11, she asked the vice president when the president gave shoot-down authority. Big question. When the vice president was in the tunnel or was in the PIOC? The vice president said that in the tunnel, the conversation was general. Stay close and keep in touch. President told him to do what he needed to do. The discussion of the shootdown was in the PIOC. Commissioner Gorlick said the staff timeline placed the vice president in the PIOC somewhere between 9.55 and 10 o'clock. Now, I said many years ago that the shootdown came at 10.15. And I'm pretty close. So it was 9.55 at 10 o'clock. What happened during this time? The first plane hit the North Tower. The second plane hit the South Tower. And the third plane hit the Pentagon. Now, what happened at 10.03? The plane crashed in Shanksville. So the shootdown authority came a little bit too late. The vice president said that two logs said he arrived in the Piac at 944. There was a confusion of times about Air Force One Two. It was a pretty confusing time. The president said, look, he didn't give orders without any without my permission. That's what he says about Dick Cheney. But Dick Cheney did. Remember, the vice president is not in the military chain of command. It's the president, the secretary of defense, and then the uh, joint chiefs. Commissioner Gorlick said that the staff thought the vice president had convened the engage order between 10.05 and 10.15. I, I said 10.15 many years ago. The vice president said his recollection was more like 10.05 at the report about an aircraft 80 miles out. Commissioner Gorlick asked if there had been an earlier conversation than that on the need for a shootdown. The president said he thought he talked about that on Air Force One or on the tarmac or on the stairs of the plane, he wasn't sure. The vice president said that after he gave the first orders, he conveyed this to the president again. Then there were two or three different decisions. The president said that he notified Ari Fleischer about the engagement, that Ari was aware of the second conversation on the shootdown. Commissioner, that would be 9.55 and 10 o'clock. Commissioner Gorlick said the vice president's times were different from those of the commission staff. She said it appeared that the vice president had been given a literal TikTok and said that we needed to be sure that the commission staff had what you have. Judge Gonzalez said he could provide that. Well, that's interesting. Why didn't that order came from the vice president himself? I'm sure that he could say it. Commissioner Gorlick asked if the president thought that when he came into the office, the CIA had authority to kill bin Laden. The president said he was never told that they didn't. When he asked George during the transition, can you kill him? His answer was that killing bin Laden wouldn't disrupt Al-Qaeda. It was not that he didn't have the authority to do it. Now, again, remember, after 9-11, the CIA made a kill list. And on top, number one, was bin Laden. So that leads me to believe that Tenet always had the authority to kill bin Laden. Remember what I said, that the CIA, before Tenet, that the CIA had went to President Clinton and drawn up scenarios about the assassination of bin Laden. One such scenario involved a CIA legendary case officer, Billy Waugh, who was involved with the capture of Carlos the Jackal, him and Carl, uh, Kofor Black in Khartoum, where bin Laden was living, and Clinton turned it down. So the CIA always had the authority to kill bin Laden. Commissioner Gorlick said that the Attorney General Ashcroft had proposed getting new authority for CIA in March of 2001. Well, it's a little bit too, well, I mean, at that point, uh, Ashcroft, uh, was a little bit too late to the game there. The CIA always had authority. Was the president aware that the CIA brought new draft authorities to the White House at that time? The president said there was never a time he had heard that the CIA did not have enough authorities. If that was so, George should have said something. I would have changed it. But he didn't need to change it. The president recalled that that's why George Tenet never said anything to Bush. 
I wonder why. Why would Tennant not tell Bush he had the authority to kill Bin Laden? Interesting. The president recalled that Bob Woodward asked him about killing Bin Laden. Look, the president said, I'm not subtle about this. He didn't know what the rules were before 9-11. After, it was no problem. Of course it wasn't. Commenting on the situation before 9-11, he was uncomfortable about uh, talking about this. Hmm. Wondering about what the law was then. So he was stuttering, sputtering, not really answering Woodward's question on the ground that he shouldn't discuss the, the assassination of a public figure. So the president seemed very stammered about this. That was the content for the blood boiling before and after. After 3,000 people had been killed, sure, the situation was different, stronger. This wasn't the same as the problem before. It was important to understand the authority the president said. His perspective was that they could kill bin Laden anytime they had the authority and they wanted to. If there was not enough authority, they had the obligation to tell them. The president said his style was access. He and Tennant had a great relationship. They did. Tennant was doing a good job. I like it. Tennessee is a policy guy. That's why a lot of the ground case officers didn't like Tennant. He is a strategic thinker. He is confident enough to say that he did not have what, was, what he needed. The president knew uh, this was never proposed to my level. He did not know whether it was proposed to Condi. Commissioner Gorlick asked about the morning meetings. How did the group deal with the domestic aspect of the threat? The president said they handled everything. Obviously, that's not true because Richard Clark tried for a good six months to hold principal meetings with, with uh, George Bush and they didn't even allow him to do so because they didn't care. Citing the number of times he had been briefed about 9-11 on Al-Qaeda, the president said he had read every one. He's a fucking liar. There was not one on a threat in America until the one he had asked for. As for the idea of reaching out to domestic agencies, Andy Card was to the domestic agencies where Condi was to the foreign policy side. Commissioner Gorlick asked then whether in a meeting like the one in July among domestic agencies, the domestic agencies were the responsibility of Andy Card, not Condi. The president said they were working together to assemble the group needed to deal with the threats at that time. Now, this was Tom Ridge. Then it was Andy. At this point in the meeting at about 11.45, Vice Chair Hamilton and Commissioner Kerry took their leave, apologizing for to leave early. The president wished them well and said he had hoped Commissioner Kerry would remain spirited. After a friendly exchange, the two commissioners departed. Looking forward, Commissioner Gorlick asked the president how he felt about the transition process, about the information flow during the transition and the amount of time it took to stand up to the government and to be ready. The president suggested with a smile that it would be better to win on election day. <laughs> Gorlick also asked about the absence of administration officials during August vacations. The vice president dearly commented that this assumed you would want them here when you get hit. The president mentioned the value of real-time communications. He had staff and facilities in Crawford. It was easier to work from Crawford than from Air Force One. They were better prepared to react there, but perhaps that situation was better now. As for the transition, a candidate, the president said, is not fully aware of threats. Maybe he shouldn't be. That's right. That's plausible deniability. He would recommend that CIA brief John Kerry. He wasn't sure how to calibrate this. The transition happened very quickly. The problem was getting people in place. The delays were too long. He hoped it, would, it had not been the administration's fault, hoped that we would get our nominations up in time. Perhaps the hearings have been delayed. He didn't know. It may make sense for some nominees not to be vetted as much as others are now. The Clinton administration had been helpful, the president said. They held meetings to pass along information. Condi met with Sandy Berger. There was a good meeting at Colin Powell's house. It was a friendly change of power. It didn't appear to have been as chilly as, for example, the Truman Eisenhower handoff had been. 
the vice president said that in August of 2001, the SVTS wasn't fully up. Now there were facilities allowing secure video teleconferencing at his home in Wyoming and at his, at his residence on Massachusetts Avenue. National Security Council meetings routinely involved people at nine or 10 sites, including General Abeziad or Jerry Bremer from Baghdad. One problem is that they had really worried about having both the president and vice president in Washington, D.C. They kept the schedule in the White House that showed in color when both the president and vice president would be in the White House. They tried to keep those occasions to a minimum. The president mentioned that they had established SVTS communication with Tony Blair, also for real-time communication. The Camp David SVTS facility was fully equipped. The president and vice president could go up there. The continuity of government issue was very serious. It was their solemn duty to do that. They now had a better ability to communicate from Air Force One. Fortunately, he did not know, did not know yet if it would be good enough in a crisis. The president commented, however, that it would be a certain chain of confusion in any emergency. And that's just to basically throw people off if information got out that everybody was in one place. That's why continuity of government took place in different groups. Like the president would be one group, the vice president would be another, secretary of defense in another, secretary of state in another. They wouldn't be all one group because if some attack happened and everyone's dead, then there would be no continuity of government. So... Commissioner Fielding, Fred Fielding, thanked the president for the meeting, mentioning his experience with executive privilege issues. The president said he appreciated the commission's help in gathering its information done the right way. And that's, of course, because the commission was being controlled by a Bush lackey, Philip Zelikow, whose personal friends were Condoleezza Rice. And they knew it. They knew that certain information would not be shown to the commission, and the commission could do nothing about it. Nothing. An incomplete commission. If there had not been understanding, he wouldn't have sent her up there. He couldn't do that without weakening the presidency. The commission has helped a lot. And, and by the way, the commission literally had to beg the State Department to have somebody, anybody from the State Department to, to be interviewed. Who did they select? Condoleezza Rice, who is not part of the inner circle called the Vulcans. That's the neocons. That's uh, Paul Wolfowitz. That's George Bush. That's Rumsfeld. That's Cheney. Andy Card, um, um, Richard Armitage. Yeah, that's them, the sickos. Um, Commissioner Fielding returned to the subject of transitions. He, now, the people that were out, like Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell and John Ashcroft, yeah, he thought they should avoid lapses. He recalled his Reagan administration experience and the fog uh, under the fog in March 1901, after the attempted assassination of President Reagan, information was thrown at you. It was important for the president and vice president to understand each other's views in case of a con contingency under the 25th Amendment. The president, smiling, said that wasn't something the vice president wants to spend a lot of time talking to him about. He thought they never discussed it. Judge Gonzalez said they discussed it once. The vice president agreed, adding that they had range to talk a lot among the lawyers, Al and David Addington. The president recalled the issue of defining incapacity. Judge Gonzalez said this had been defined, at least on paper. The president said there was no problem with policy continuity. The vice president understood our process and our strategies. The vice president understands it just like the president would. Commissioner Fielding recalled the, the precedent of President Reagan's relationship with Vice President Bush and the issue of command authority. The president said they were in good shape there. It was an interesting topic. Having been through other administrations, the president and vice president had to discuss these things. One had to force them to do so. The vice president commented that the 9-11 situation was unusual. It was better to have the president relate directly to the secretary of defense. That's the military chain of command. The president said the relationship with the vice president was good in part because there was no political rivalry. Relationships differ from administration to administration. Everyone was different. He didn't worry because he had a unique relationship with the vice president. The vice president isn't interested in my job, and I'm not interested in his. That's because the running joke in Washington was if Bush died, uh, if Cheney died, Bush would become president. In other words, Vice President Cheney was indeed the president of the United States. And he really was. 
Bush was stupid. The president recalled being out in a pasture in Crawford, and the vice president came to him with the results of his vice presidential search committee. The president recalled saying to Dick, you're it. This wasn't for when times are good. It is a decision for when times are bad. He had no idea that something like 9-11 was coming. It just turned out to be a wise reaction to his instincts. The president added that the temptation was to pick a political hotshot. For instance, someone who could deliver the South. That was a different approach, which he thought should not be used as an example. The vice president discussed the briefings for incoming presidents. They discussed the PSYOP and nuclear weapons. The military scares the hell out of the president-elect, and then they go away. He thought instead that there should be kind of short course by the military for the new civilian leadership. They should use exercises, cases, and scenarios. It should be educational. Incoming leaders don't know how, when, what questions to ask. They end up having to go through a crisis in order to understand what the issues were. The president said he remembered thinking that George Tenet briefing him thought he was in for a job interview. George was used to presidents bringing in a new person and old CIA directors going. The CIA shouldn't be political, not at all. He remembered talking to George, reading his body language, and George trying to read his. He didn't know if it changed the way he acted or not. The issue was the CIA director shouldn't feel he's auditioning for a job. Commissioner Fielding commented, commended that, uh, commented that he felt like a test that would be on the CIA director's mind. Commissioner Romer asked if the president had any recollection of tenant's briefing on August 17, 2001. No, the president said. He probably saw him, but he didn't remember it. Tenet certainly did. He didn't remember anything particular about a threat then. Wow, really? Okay. The meeting in August of 2001 were huge because according to Tenet later on, that these meetings were security briefing meetings. August 6 PDB was, of course, Bin Laden determined to strike inside the United States. This was information gleaned from Ahmed Rassam, who was an Al-Qaeda affiliate involved with the Millennium bombing operation, which was to, that he was supposed to drive a bomb to LAX airport and blow up the airport. But also, this was an intercontinental bombing operation that involved Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, and if that sounds familiar, he is the founder of the Islamic State in Levant that was once originally called Wal Jihad al tawhid and that was created in Jordan. But the Jordanian authorities heard about a plot, and they arrested a number of these people, and there was also a plot to hijack a plane in India to, for the release of a Pakistan militant named Omar Saeed Sheikh, who, by the way, later on gave a money transfer from the Pakistan ISI Director General, Mahmoud Ahmed, of $100,000 to the lead 9-11 hijacker, Muhammad Atta. Omar, Omar Saeed Sheikh was a conduit. So this intelligence threat reporting, this matrix, all throughout August, would definitely have been known to who? The President of the United States. President only got three meetings from George Tenet. You're telling me that the president didn't know anything about these meetings? He's fucking lying. Why? Because he would have to tell the commission that, yes, I was getting threat daily matrix reports three times by the CIA involving an attack imminent inside the United States. The next question would be, Mr. President, if you were getting daily threat reports about attacks inside the United States, why didn't you make the necessary precautions to secure the country? That would put the president in a very illuminating spot. So in other words, he could say, I never got these reports. I never met. That would make the CIA a liar. And he can't throw them under the bus because the CIA could certainly throw the president under the bus because they got the intelligence. So I don't know. I can't recall. Plausible deniability. At its finest. Commissioner Romer, active tenant, had any had said anything then about an Islamic extremist learning to fly. Huge question. The president said no, and he thought he would have remembered that. George feels free to talk. 
the PDB briefing is actually a wider discussion triggered by the PDB. Sometimes an item didn't merit discussion, but if you're sitting here in the Oval Office, you cannot sit here if you're told about a threat. What's the action plan? That's the first question. Condi was on type of her game in situations like that. Remember what she said to the night of the commission. We never thought that they would use airplanes as weapons. Well, that would be a lie. Why? Because they got the briefing, according to the FBI, and the director then was Louis Free, that they got the information from the, from the Philippines investigators about the Pachinka plot. How do I know that? Well, the lead investigator, Rodolfo Mendoza, is the one who said, I gave the transcripts of one interrogation of Abdul Hakim Arad, who told me about the multi-phase operation Bajinka plot, he gave it to the FBI. The FBI gave it to the FAA and the President of the United States. Are you telling me that the President looked at it and said, all right, that the FBI said, okay, and nobody did nothing about it? Really? Credible threat reporting? Not from third-hand sources? Directly from a terrorist involved with Somebody who was there for the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, who's the uncle, who's the nephew of a wanted intercontinental terrorist in college, Sheikh Mohammed, the alleged mastermind 9 11. You're telling me that nobody did nothing with this uh, pertinent information? Wow. Condi, he said, had a strong personality. She had to have one to deal with people like Rumsfeld, Tennant, and Powell. Some people have wondered if she would have had what it takes as a relatively young woman dealing with these stars. She does. She is phenomenal, especially given this cast of thoroughbreds. They trusted her to a point, just like they trusted Powell to a point, just like they trusted John Ashcroft to a point. But when it comes to the bigger issues, the, co the, the, the covert issues, they were not trusted at all because those issues were illegal. She is not afraid to call them to account. Some people might be intimidated by Donna Rumsfeld. He's an old pro. She's not. He is so confident when he tells you things. DOD reacts to that. Condi had daily phone calls with these principals and weekly lunches. Commissioner Romer mentioned the commission's visit the day before to CENTCOM and SOCOM headquarters. The need for better human intelligence had come up. The president said... He sure would like it too. Without it, you don't have the information to send troops in. There are no targets. Commissioner Slade Gordon asked if that was true before 9-11. There was no authority in DOD to shoot down hijacked planes. Was that correct? That's a good question. Absolutely, the president said. The vice president said that was also his understanding. Commissioner Lehman referred back to an earlier question posed by Commissioner Kerry. Presidents had asked for options on bin Laden and had basically been offered a choice of cruise missiles on one hand and the Normandy invasion on the other. But there were other options, such as those developed in the era of state-sponsored terrorism options using special operation forces. Commissioner Lehman talked about some of these capabilities, including the penetrating C-130 variants at Hurlburt Field. President Clinton didn't know, didn't know about those, he said. One reason for this problem, Commissioner Lehman contended, was that before Goldwater Nichols, all these chiefs would come in to brief the president. Commissioner Lehman recalled some experiences with this in the Nixon administration and the growing concern about showing military disagreements to the president. But the president could hear diverse military perspectives on a problem. Now it was just one voice. The president urged the commission to remember that they were dealing with the capability to find a person. Fine. The problem, though, was that there was no larger strategy to eliminate the whole group. He didn't remember getting briefed on the capabilities at Hurlbut. The vice president said he didn't know about those capabilities. They weren't suggested at the White House until after the U.S. had gone into Afghanistan. They had tried using special operations forces to get Mullah Omar with good information. Even then, he left and they missed him. The president said that before 9-11, we weren't on a war footing either. He had recently talked to Tony Blair about this. Tony Blair is the prime minister of Great Britain. He told them that they were being criticized for not launching a preemptive attack against Afghanistan. And they were criticized for preemptively attacking Iraq. 
Blair had commented, the president recalled that if the president had told him before 9-11 that he wanted to put force in Afghanistan, he, Blair, would have been floored. I would have looked at you like a nut, Blair said. There was an appetite for a throat slit, killing bin Laden, not a war footing. A president can't force preemptive war without a cause. The country didn't like war. I don't like it either, the president said. <laughs> yeah. The president said he wasn't interested in getting the NSPD, though, without 9-11. He would have had a problem of, of how to take on the mindset of the nation before 9-11. This would have been a doctrine of striking before being struck. The commission could see it from his perspective as a doctrine of preemption. This would seem like an ultimate act of unilateralism without a casus belly in people's minds. It was one thing to send in a squad to do somebody in. It was another to attack Al-Qaeda with standoff weapons and the military. Now, Bob Kerry once said, 9-11 commission, that if, if the State Department had told the nation on TV about the 1990 East Africa bombings. Hey, we were just bombed by a credible threat, Bin Laden and Al Qaeda, and we need to attack them before they attack us further and the danger could come to our shores. You, Bob Kerry suggests that the majority of the American public would get behind it. That, hey, let's deal with the danger. Obviously, they're dangerous. They've proven it. Let's eliminate the threat. According to Bush, that this scenario would not have worked. That's what he's saying, that this scenario would have not have worked. The president repeated that the problem would have been how to implement the NSPD without another attack on America. He was prepared to take that on, but people would have argued that he had lost his mind. The president observed that Commissioner Ben Benisti seemed to be champing at the bit to ask a question as usual. Commissioner Ben Benisti smiled and then asked about the apparent disconnect between these decisions and the attack on the USS Cole. Bin Laden himself had not been linked to the Cole attack, but the premise was that diplomacy was supposed to get the Taliban to cough up the hairball Bin Laden. The Clinton administration had issued a threat to the Taliban to hold them accountable for any other attacks. The Cole had happened on October 2000. According to the staff, by mid-December 2000, the evidence had shown beyond any doubt that Al-Qaeda was linked to the Cole attack. The president said he was curious about that statement. The president said he was unaware that Clinton had made such a threat to the Taliban. The term preliminary judgment had been argued to him. The report, he said, they might be connected. Commissioner Benvenisi referred to the evidence implicating Khalid, that's Wali Benatash. He acknowledged that the CIA and FBI had not reported a conclusion, but the evidence was clear. He said that Attorney General Ashcroft had testified to concerns over the command and control structure of Al-Qaeda, and that was mystifying to him. Why was it important to link bin Laden directly to the Al-Qaeda attack on the coal? The problem, therefore, was whether to make good on the threat by retaliating against the Taliban. The NSA were listening to a Yemen hub in Yemen, this house in Yemen, which was a communications transfer to Al-Qaeda all throughout the world. And so they would call this house in Yemen to pass messages to other Al-Qaeda contacts. The NSA heard every single phone call from 1996 and probably earlier to 2002. Let's just say from 96, 2002, that's six years worth of phone calls. What do you think they were talking about those calls? Well, according to some in the intelligence community, the USS coal bombing could have been prevented. Now, According to uh, intelligence relating from the Millennium Plot, one ship in particular was going to be attacked was the USS Sullivan's. But um, the boat that was carrying the weapons, the bombs, to bomb the, the, the Sullivan's, there was so many bombs on the boat, the boat sank to the bottom of the sea. So they had to talk about the new operation. Well, the new operation was the Millennium Plot, and that involved the USS, uh, uh, USS Colt which was docked on the port of Aden, Yemen. The intelligence was there. Do not go near Yemen. It's a hotspot for Al-Qaeda. They're willing to attack U.S. naval ships. That intelligence was there. So then the captain of the U.S.'s Cole, Kirk Leopold, basically was 
that information was not shared with him, even though he knew Yemen was definitely a hotspot for Al Qaeda, and he was given that wasn't given that protection. The NSA most likely had that information. I can't say for sure, but they most likely had that information. And they didn't share it. Question is why? The president said he had never said, cough up or I'll blast you. If he had said that, well, in that case, you have to be ready to blast. Commissioner Benveniste said there was intelligence that clearly established Al-Qaeda's responsibility. So then the threat to retaliate against the Taliban should have been triggered by the attack of the coal. Absolutely. Judge Gonzalez tried to clarify they didn't strike the Taliban because they didn't know bin Laden was behind the attack. Right, that's plausible deniability. Remember, they don't need to know too much. Commissioner Lehman recalled that the FBI CIA claimed that this was not established until August 2001. The president said Commissioner Benvenisi knew more about the evidence of the Cole case than he did. The commissioner had known more about the Yemeni courthouse case and this. The president didn't remember hearing a definitive statement. They did it, at least not at this level. Was it certain at lower levels? Commissioner Robert tried to interject and clarify his, the exchanges. Commissioner Benvenisti re reiterated that the staff had found that the Intelligence Committee knew Al-Qaeda was clearly responsible for the call attack by December 12th of 2000, at the latest. Like I said, he agreed that this had not been conveyed to the president in a report, but he wondered if the president had heard that statement, though the community was less sure about the links to Al-Qaeda's high command. The president said he didn't know what that meant. It didn't come to him. And guess what? The president could basically say, I only need to know what I need to know. I don't need to know everything. That's called plausible deniability, right? Because if he manages to slip up, well, guess what? Hey, I'm not the one you should be blaming. Go blame these people. They had the information first. So, what I'm trying to say is the intelligence community probably had all the information prior to 9-11, prior to the USS Cole, prior to the East Africa bombings, prior to all this. So why didn't they stop it? That's the question. Why couldn't they stop it? The 9-11 Commission seems to think so, regarding USS Cole anyway. The president said he and his advisors did discuss what the appropriate response should be to the cold attack. If the response is, say, cruise missiles, then you have to do the analysis. The enemy wants you to flinch or put a cruise missile on a $15 tent. On the Taliban, the president continued, we didn't issue the threat. If you go after the Taliban, you have to eliminate the Taliban. A lesser response may mean you incapacitate Mullah Omar. But if you're wrong and miss him, you inflame the situation even worse way. But you did that after the 1990 East Africa bombings. Now, before that, the Taliban had meetings about what to do with bin Laden. Because the Saudi intelligence director general, Prince Turkey bin Faisal, had met with the Taliban High Council from Pakistan in Afghanistan to talk about bin Laden. Should they hand him over to the Saudis? And the Taliban basically considered it. But after these missile cruise responses, by the Clinton administration in response to the 1990 East Africa bombings, Taliban said, fuck you. To them, the cruise missile is the ultimate expression of technology opposed to the guerrilla fighter. In other words, the president went on, unless you're real good, you're not going to get the Taliban. You must do what we did. That means a massive smart operation. That means adult aircraft carriers, aircraft based in blank, overwhelming force, refueling and other supply. You have to wipe out the Taliban. If you just get Mullah Omar, you haven't already eradicated the Taliban, and you haven't eliminated Al-Qaeda. Therefore, you, you tell the Taliban you made a threat. They don't care. They do care if they are eliminated. After 9-11, the president said his blood was indeed boiling. He delivered an ultimatum to the Taliban. The Taliban did this. He used the first up-bent arm gesture, but it served its purpose and showed the perspective from the commander-in-chief. So, before 9-11, Bush said to the Taliban, hand over bin Laden to us. But the Taliban said no. Why? Because one, they said, give us evidence of his wrongdoing. And they didn't. But the Taliban still considered it anyway because 
Bin Laden is a thorn in their side. He's bringing so much attention to a country that they're fighting over the Northern Alliance in control of. They didn't need the United States to come and interfere with that nonsense. Bin Laden was attracting all types of uh, Western uh, intelligence agencies. Taliban didn't need this. So they put him under house arrest in the year 2000. No more talking to the press. No more fat ones. So the Taliban met numerous times about what to do with bin Laden. But after 9-11, Taliban said, uh, we'll hand over bin Laden if you give us evidence of him being involved with 9-11. And Bush said, we don't deal with, no, we don't, we don't negotiate with terrorists. But you were, you were going to negotiate with them, even though they were terrorists before 9-11. Commissioner Gorlick raised the issue of evidence and action. The president said the best response to call was to eliminate the group, eliminate their structure. You could arrest people, and they had. He thought that perhaps they had arrested five of the seven people who were carried out the attack, though he recalled the Yemenis had let some people out and then got them back in custody. The law enforcement aspect worked okay. The vice president remembered that the problem in the early months was getting the FBI in to be able to do the work. Well, the State Department certainly didn't back the FBI there because when John O'Neill and Ali Soufan went to Yemen to try and investigate the coal attack, basically, like I said, the Yemen U.S. Ambassador, Bobby Bodine, called the State Department and said, hey, get this freaking idiot out of here. And so they called the FBI and said, all right, get John O'Neill out of there. And they did. So that investigation dragged on. The president said that was to find the bombers and hunt for clues. He was trying to address a different question, which was how the question of responsibility for the coal related to action against the network, not individuals. It was the question of how to bring bin Laden or the Taliban to account. Well, the Taliban has, the Taliban's not even in Yemen, for one. Commissioner Ben Benisi asked if only 9-11 could have done that. The president said the strategy was being developed before 9-11. He would have tried to use our power and our charm on preemption without 9-11 because of the coal. Commissioner Gorlick said it therefore looked like the NSPD put the president in a box. The president agreed. That is my point. But I was willing to pursue it, he said. It would not have been easy. He referred again to Prime Minister Blair's argument in their conversation earlier that day. But he said it was easier to make the case after 9-11 people could fully understand how different things were. Without the attack, the president said, suppose he had gone forward with this new strategy on September 30th, developing a plan to wipe out Al-Qaeda. People would have said, well, but he still would have pursued it. It would have been a lot slower, Jamie, he said. They had to develop a complex strategy. It would not have been easy. One of the commissioners noted that they had already been meeting for three hours. The president smiled and said he wanted to go at least three and three hours and five minutes. <laughs> Commissioner Ben Benisti mentioned Condi Rice's statement that nobody had thought of using airplanes as weapons. Oh boy. The president said that nobody ever told her about this possibility. He stopped himself, saying he shouldn't speak for her. That's because she's not there, because that would mean that Condi Rice wasn't informed about the Bajinka operation and that the Pajinka operation may have been known to the president, and the president didn't relate this to Condi Rice. Why? Because if Condi Rice told the line of the commission that they didn't know that the that planes would be used as weapons, is she lying? No, because it wasn't told to her yet. But if it was known to the president, and he didn't tell Condi Rice, that means he was shielding not only her, but himself because the information was there. The planes were going to be used as weapons. Five years prior to 9-11, Commissioner Benvenisi said he thought the intelligence on this possibility had surely been available. Yes, it was, the Bajinka operation. The president asked if the commissioner was sure about that. Yes, Commissioner Benvenisi said. The intelligence committee had collected a dozen instances of planned use of suicide planes and there were the measures to protect the G8 summit in Genova, including a CAP over Genova and placement of anti-aircraft batteries. The president replied that nobody had said, by the way, a vulnerability of America is not to him or to Condi Rice either. As for Genoa, the president continued, 
They chose the airspace wherever he goes. That was not Italian to a warning that airplanes would be used as weapons. Genoa was a war zone. They had gotten all these threats. The president remembered flying in and seeing nothing but soldiers. They drove down the streets of the city and did not see anyone but police. The president repeated, how can a president think of a threat? You can invent a threat because there was no fly zone over Genoa. A president has to deal with real information, but there was real information and they ignored it. Commissioner Benvenisi said that President Mubarak claimed he had warned Italian authorities about possible suicide planes. That was true because earlier in 2001, uh, Bin Laden had asked an Egyptian affiliate to Al-Qaeda from the Egyptian Islamic Jihad, which was run by Dr. Ayman al-Zwahiri, who was the second in command of Al-Qaeda. Bin Laden told this person, because he owned his own uh, personal plane, to take that plane and crash it into the president's palace, President Mubarak. And this person went to the authorities instead and told them what he had heard from Bin Laden. The president said he had never heard about that because the airspace was closed all over Genoa. He should think of aircraft hitting buildings? No. Presidents had to rely on real information. It's amazing. Right. You had the I'll give you examples. In 1996, you had uh, Air France 8989 in um, Algeria that was hijacked by the Algerian Islamic Jihad, which is a Salafist group with ties to Al Qaeda and that they were going to hijack this plane and crash it into the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Then you had the, um, of course, the Bajinka plot, which was the first instance known to them that there were cells inside the United States were waiting on orders to hijack a number of planes. And according to that, it was 10. And that's where the idea of 9-11 came from. So they had information. And, and also, like I said, in the year 2001, early in 2001, the spring and summer, foreign intelligence from Germany, from Israel, from Saudi Arabia, from Russia, from Iran, from France, all this information was coming inside the United States. Hey, we got intelligence that Al-Qaeda and bin Laden want to use planes as weapons, that they're going to try and attack inside the United States. Now, the intelligence services will tell you, domestic, that the problem was a lack of information. But the reality was they were awash in it. Because if there were awash in information and they didn't act on it, someone has to take the blame. Right? So they lied about that. The State Department lied about getting this information. Why? Because plausible deniability. They didn't want to know about the attacks, but they knew something was coming. But they're certainly not going to point the blame because they too are going to be chopped in the, uh, the gallows. Chairman King, um, the president said he never heard about that because the airspace was closed over general. He couldn't think of aircraft in the building. No, the president had to rely on real information. They can't be imagining things. That was why George Senate was there every morning with the briefer. Chairman Keene thanked the president for a very good discussion. He thought the question had been good. He wished the president the best. The president said he hoped the commission had enjoyed the opportunity. This is not a gotcha moment for me or my predecessor. They weren't playing gotcha. This was too important for America. It was it would be good if citizens could take this moment and convert it into something for future presidents. And um, yeah, I don't need to read the rest of this. So um, there you have it. This is it. Now remember, this interview was um, not under oath. So that means that the president and the vice president only lied, could have been lying in some of these instances. Um, and also, too, they didn't share with the commission everything. They didn't have to because they weren't pressured. Um, so we have that, too. 
And I don't know what information they would have. Remember, they needed plausible deniability. Remember to only know certain things, not everything. What the what the commission should have done was basically pressure the NSA about their intelligence operation involving Bin Laden satellite phone and the House in Yemen. And they barely asked the NSA anything. So the CIA took the fall for them. And basically, what fall? Nobody got fired. Nobody got in trouble. And the only person in the two congressional inquiries that got close was Carl Levin of the Joint House. That's why I made a special podcast episode regarding that. So there we have it. That's the transcript of the 9-11 Commission's interview of the president and vice president in 2004. I will link it to the bottom of the description in this video. And um, guys, have a good night and thank you for watching.